Okay. Right, so this is the first paper for today, which is um, Turing's uh, 1936 paper. I guess considered one of the, the papers that started the field of computer science and why you know, people call Alan Turing the, the father of computer science. So I, I didn't know the connection until I read this paper like a couple months ago, and I really felt strongly that a lot of things he said were very prophetic and be good to share with the wider audience, which is why I prepared this talk. Okay, so uh, as usual, I'd just like to start with telling you what, what the main contributions of uh, this paper. So this paper was in 1936, it's almost um, 80 years. So the first thing, uh, or the most obvious thing, is uh, Turing obviously proposed a model of computation that today we call uh, Turing machines, and uh, also the term Turing complete, I guess, is related to this paper. Turing complete is something that is uh, equivalent to a Turing machine, essentially. Uh, okay, so one thing to say is that this is not the first paper that proposed it. Um, so Church famously wrote a paper about lambda calculus that, that predates this by a couple months. Uh, in fact, he developed the lambda calculus in the early 1930s, 1931 onwards. So this is not the first model. But it was the most convincing one, and I'll try to explain later why uh, it became much more popular uh, throughout the years. The second is the concept of a universal machine, which was, uh, it, it seems common to us now that you can have one machine or one computer that could perform any kind of task with a different kind of software. Back in the 30s, that wasn't a, a, a thing that was even known, right? You had to build a custom machine for each application, so to, a machine to calculate differential equations, a machine to calculate other things, right? So you needed one machine for each task. So what Turing showed was that it's, it's possible to just one physical machine, but have different software, so to speak, and then let, let the machine do different things depending on you know, the software. So that was a kind of a revolutionary idea, I think, at the time. And he, Turing was the first to come up with this idea. Okay, and the last part, which is related to the Entscheidens problem, is he showed that, of course, this is uh, unsolvable based on showing that no Turing machine could solve it. Again, this is not the first paper to do this. Church did this a couple months earlier, uh, but he did it in a slightly different way, and I'll try to show uh, Turing's proof. Okay, so, so let's uh, go back to a little bit about why Turing came to write this paper. So I think we have to go sort of, I'll, I'll go as far back as the... Uh, uh, late uh, 1900s uh, to David Hilbert. So Hilbert famously, uh, you know, has this thing called Hilbert's program, where he is trying to uh, formulate an axiomatic foundation for mathematics. So he asks some questions along these lines, right? Uh, so mathematics here meaning some formal um, axiomatic system that captures all of mathematics. Can we find such a system that is consistent, complete, and decidable? So decidable is related to the Entscheidens problem because that that. Uh, in English, it's like the decision problem, right? So it's related to the last property. So just for completeness, I'll go. I have to briefly explain what all three are to get to what citable means. So I'll use the whiteboard for that. Okay. So, uh, so in Hilbert's program, uh, you have a formal axiomatic system. So basically that means a bunch of axioms and some rules of inference, typically those from first order logic. So that's the, that's the system. So you have axioms, you have axioms, and say rules of inference. It's a purely symbolic system. So you don't have to know what all the symbols mean. You just take the axioms and apply them and apply them, and eventually uh, you can generate all the uh, all the theorems, right? all the statements that are true in this uh, formal axiomatic system. So to be consistent means um, so let's say we have a statement um, um, S, and then you have um, not S. So, we see, we see, let's say this denotes a proof. A proof just means take the axioms and apply the, manipulate them with the rules, right? And that's what just what a proof means. Um, so, if you could find proofs, uh, if there's S, such as S, where you can find a proof of S and a proof of not S, then the system is not consistent. So, the consistent means there's no such S where you can prove both S and the negation of S, which makes intuitive sense because while well, only one of them would be, would be sort of true, right? Let's say S is a statement um, 1 plus 1 equals to 2, and not S is a statement 1 plus 1 not equals to 2, right? So if your system could prove both of these um, uh, statements, then it's sort of inconsistent. Right? So you, you, you can't find such a statement. There's consistency. Okay, the second property which is more important is um, Completeness. 
so completeness uh, is related. Completeness says uh, so for okay, let me read this. Okay, now, completeness says for every statement S, right, either S or its inverse has a proof. Which means we can cover all the statements. There's no gap, right? Every statement, either the statement itself or the opposite of the statement, has a proof. Right? And that has to be true because the statement is either true or false, right? So if the statement is false, the opposite must be true. That means we can find a proof. Right? So that's uh, complete. Okay. And, um, so it's basically a system where you probably can hardly say that a code exists because you cannot either prove or disprove it. Sorry, the question again? I didn't quite catch that. It's a system where you can hardly say that mm -hmm. the code exists because it's very hard to either prove or disprove it as far as I'm aware. That the code exists? Code. That the goal? God exists. God. Supreme. God. God. Oh, right, right. Okay, uh, well, I'll not go there. Okay, <laughs> let's talk about the last property, decidable. So that's the one we're going to focus on. Decidable means, given a statement, S, right, the, the decision algorithm or procedure will tell you whether S can be proven, whether there, there exists a proof for S. So let's say in this case, let's say we know 1 plus 1 equals to 2, right? So there's no proof of 1 plus 1 not equal to 2. So if you give this statement to the decision algorithm, it will say, yes, there is a proof. It may not tell you what the proof is, though. It will just tell you there is a proof. And if you give it this statement, it will tell you, no, there is no proof of this. OK? So that's what the side of one means. OK. Uh, so just to move on to the next person. So Gödel famously showed that uh, mathematics is, if if uh, if mathematics is consistent, then it must be incomplete. So he exhibits a statement, uh, some statement G, so the Gödel statement G, where G and not G have both have no proofs. So. There's no way to get from here to any of these. So that's the Gödel statement. This is similar to the liar's product. It's like, I am telling a lie kind of thing. So there's no way you could find a proof to any of these. So what more condition is the system have to be strong enough to have it? Ah, yes, that's right. That's a technical condition that to, to, to create the statement G, you need to have some components of uh, uh, arithmetic, right? To do like, I think, addition and multiplication. But anyway, so yeah, so that, that's a technical condition needed for, for Gödel's proof. Uh, and generally, you would expect a system able to formalize mathematics to have that properties. So, so we'll assume that is available. Okay, so that's that's how the question. So there's no com we don't have completeness basically. Um, so does it see, does it mean we don't have uh, decidability, right? Which is what Turing. So the question at that point this was 1931. So after that, the question became, uh, is it decidable though? So in com completeness was uh, settled by Gödel. Right? So. Uh, we could still be um, decidable because if you feed G to the decidable, decidability algorithm, it will tell you no, there is no proof. And if you feed it not G, you also say no, there is no proof. Right? That's, that, that, that technically is possible. Right? It's possible to still have a, a decision algorithm. Of course, most mathematicians didn't think so, didn't think that we, we, we have a decision algorithm. So most of the work went to trying to show that there is no such algorithm. So, and so there are systems where neither G or not G has a proof, and they right. are very practical. Kind of. So you can yes. express a lot of sentences, a lot of claims that make sense, and you still can decide whether. Of course, are. yeah, yeah, and yeah. So mathematics is once you have some arithmetic, is you have this situation, right? So I'll skip Max Newman. Uh, so Turing. So uh, I think the story was in thirty-five. Uh, he was lying in a field. I mean, he he actually heard about uh, incompleteness from, from Newman, who gave a lecture on this uh, at Cambridge. And um, so in 1935, he was lying in a field somewhere in, in Cambridge, and he thought about how he would go about it. And sort of the story goes, he was inspired by, uh, he, he, was start, invi he was inspired by uh, his mother's uh, typewriter. So the problem with uh, the Entscheidung's problem was, uh, how do you say there is no algorithm to do something? There's no, well, they don't call it algorithm back then, I guess. There's no mechanical procedure to do something, right? There's no procedure that can tell us whether a statement is has a proof or not, right? So the the real question was uh, at least the big thing you have to solve it before you could attack the problem was how do you define what you mean by a mechanical procedure? So Turing was probably influenced by the, the typewriter, I think, in his design of the uh, automatic machines, right? So he calls it um, the A machine or the automatic machines. And I'll again try to sketch out what uh, what that is. I'll erase this.
So you see why it's related to a typewriter. Sketch it out. Let's see. So the machine has an a infinitely long uh, tape. The tape is, so this is your kind of like memory. And you can see this is how like on the piece of paper you have this um, infinitely long uh, way to, so you can type letters into the paper from a typewriter, right? So you have a, you have a, I guess you have some kind of a head. And you have some kind of object here. So basically you have this tape and you have this machine and you could you could move it one step to the left, one step to the right. And then there's some uh, there's some state, some state here. That controls and then you can also you can write to the tape, you can write a symbol like the number one. And you can also um, write two and you can also erase um, erase the tape. Erase just means write the blank symbol. So you can, you can overwrite what you wrote on the tape. It turns out that not to be necessary for uh, for Turing completeness, you could actually not. You can actually only have a tape that is right once and still do it. But it's easier if you allow people to just overwrite the tape, which just works like kind of how RAM works. You can just write in the location of RAM over and over again. Okay, turns out not necessary. Any case, so this is the thing. So to to uh, demonstrate this machines in, in the paper, he developed some programs, or what we would call programs. So his machine is like a weird programming language, basically. So he developed some programs. Um, he's only, he only considered one kind of program. The program is going, only going to print uh, the numbers 0 and 1. It's kind of interesting. So this was in the time where uh, people were making decimal machines. So binary wasn't a very popular format uh, in the 30s. But he decided to use binary. So this program would print um, the decimal expansion of uh, a number between 0 and 1. Right? A, a real number between 0 and 1. Uh, between 0 and 1. Right? Let's say, for example, 1 third. Right? 1 third is um, the binary expansion is 0 0.010101, so on, so on, forever. Right? The, uh, you can just trust me on this. This is the binary expansion. <laughs> so this is also equal to 1 quarters plus 1 over... 16. No, 816, yeah. 64, right? Yeah. Oh, sorry, 64. What was it? 64. Uh, it's this infinite series, basically. So this is one third, right? So this is the first program he writes in the paper. I'll also write it here. But I'll write it in a different form that's easier to understand. So uh, you basically have a symbol. Oh, so it's kind of a simple program. So I'll just draw like um, square for the uh, the blank symbol. So you start in the state A, and for the blank symbol, you would you would print what well, you print the zero, move to the right, go to the state B. Go to state B, you would print the 1, move to the right, and go to state A. Okay, so the way you look at this is, this is the symbol on the tape that you are um, reading, and this is your state, uh, which presumably always start in A. So the triple, the triple in the square means, so if, I, if I'm on state A, and I see this is the, the state of the logic box, and I see the symbol blank, this is the first thing, is the symbol you will print, so you print the zero. You can just sort of simulate this uh, on this on this uh, imaginary tape. So you print a basically I'll print a zero. This the head. Then I'll move the head to the right one step. You can only move one step to be here. Then the next state will be B, right? And then we then start over from B. You see the blank symbol. We print the, the number one. Move the head to the right. right. And then we go back to state. A and so on and so forth. And, and you can sort of surmise this will print 0, 1 forever. So this is the first program. Uh, Turing's version is a little bit more complex. He actually he actually leaves all the uh, all the even spaces empty so that you can actually do some computation. You can use it for scratch space later. Uh, so he separates between the space where you print the numbers, which he only writes once, and the space he actually leaves the space between them so you can um, store some stuff for doing computation later, for more complex um, programs. So, so this is three, and then um, okay, and, he, and here's here, here comes the title, right? So he calls all these numbers, these numbers which can be generated from Turing machines, computable numbers. So he calls this computable numbers. Okay, so that's where the term comes from. So this is his way. This is the examples he used to illustrate that um, um, he has created a general machine. So let me briefly explain uh, numbers. So, um, so we have uh, we have uh, natural numbers, right? Natural numbers, which is 
one, two, three, and so on. Then we have the uh, rational, right? <coughs> some kind of n over m. Then we have algebraic, which is the solution of some equations, ax squared equals to two. So square two is algebraic. And we have, uh, before Turing anyway, we have, then we have transcendental, which is sort of everything else, like uh, pi, and e, and other hot stuff is transcendental. So they are not some equation. And they have very complicated um, decimal expansions. So this is what we know about. And then we have the, yeah, this is the rest of all the real numbers anyway. So uh, Turing's um, uh, computable numbers actually is, forms a new class. It is strictly bigger than all the classes we've known so far, which is bigger than, oh, it's bigger than algebraic. I mean, each one is a subset. So natural subset of rational, rational subset of algebraic. And um, so computable is a uh, superset of algebraic to some extent. It, it includes all the algebraic numbers. Uh, and it also includes these two. Uh, it includes pi and e, right? Because you've heard of people calculating pi to like 9 million digits, right? So they obviously wrote some kind of program. And of course, you can write that program in, in this form. It's just going to be very cumbersome, but you could do it. So um, pi is also a computable number. So that gives credit to the, the fact that you can generate lots of different numbers. OK, so that's the Turing machine. I show you the program for 1 third. OK, so yeah. So why did this model uh, became so much more popular than the other competing models of computation, like the lambda calculus and the general recursive functions? So the main thing is going to do with the way Turing argues about why this particular model, this, this, this hit and this tape, and you can move left and right and all that, why this uh, system um, is able to express all the possible functions that you can want to ever um, compute. Right, and he, and this became eventually known as the Turing thesis, and later on, because Church was the first person to come up with a model, became known as the Church Turing thesis, right? So it says that these models capture all that we can do with computation. So the first thing he talked about was an appeal to intuition, which is, um, he thought about how someone, let's say a mathematician working on a typewriter would, would be able to solve a problem, right? So he would have some finite states of mind, where he thinks about different parts of the problem. He would type things onto the, the, the symbol. So he would, he, he would obviously use discrete symbols and, and a finite set, because if you have infinite number of symbols, you would get confused over them, because there would be two that looks pretty much the same to the human eye, right? So it's to do with sort of human finite and limitations, right? So you have discrete set of symbols, you have finite, states of mind, right, which is the finite states of the machine. And then you can do this little simple operation, smooth left, move right. Um, the second is he also gave a machine that can take a, a formal, a description of a formal axiomatic system and enumerate all the theorems, which is all the statements that can be provable. And you can see how you could write such a program, right? You could just start with the axioms and keep applying the, the rules of inference and the axioms in different order, right? And you get um, all the possible theorems, but you, of course this program will never complete because uh, yeah, the set of theorems is infinite, right? But you could generally enumerate all of them, right? Looking at the tree of all the ways you could apply the, the, the axioms to generate proofs. So uh, that's that. And lastly, of course, you showed that uh, beyond what I've talked about here, that large class of numbers are, are computable. Obviously, you can see that numbers based on some kind of summation, some kind of infinite series is, is clearly going to be computable because you can, you can write a program that adds up the terms of that series and produce the, the numbers, right? And famously, numbers like pi and e are computable. OK, so that was the first part, right? That's the, uh, the Turing machine. Oh, and oh, one last thing I, I sort of wrote down, I forgot from my slides, was the Turing machine, I think it was something that's not mentioned in, here in other places, but the Turing machine has, has enough knobs for theoreticians down the years to actually modify the model and make changes and add restrictions to it. Because people have things, things like two tape Turing machines, or where you can't write to the tape, you can only write to the tape once. So you can have all these little tweaks to the base model and you can develop a, a theory around it. Whereas some of the other models are, like for example, Church's Lambda Calculus is so like simple and they're like, you can't really change it very much. So it, it's hard for people to you know, produce more work based on this because the model is, yeah, I don't know. That's just an observation, I guess. Statement is not entirely true. Perhaps. All com models of computations have been modified because it's an interesting way of checking, for example, true. Church right. Process. Right. So there are other lambda calculi that look. Not of, yes, of course you can. I mean, the, it's just that it's not as easy to think of all these modifications as you would with a Turing machine because it's, it has this um, fairly physical environment which you can sort of imagine. You know, what, what if instead of a, a, a linear tape, I have a grid, and so it, the fact that it is more complicated actually may may have helped it. I, I think, but uh, I can't say for sure. Of course, it's just an observation. Okay, so uh, let's move on. Okay, so that's the last point I have about this. So the universal machine, okay, that's the, 
and basically what, what we know today, I guess you've, you've seen it, right? You have programs like um, PyPy and all this, which is basically a, <coughs> a program written in uh, the same language which can execute programs of the same language. So a Python interpreter written in Python would be one example. And this is, of course, the uh, you know, a Turing machine interpreter written in the Turing machine language, right? So like an example of how you look like, this is not the one from Turing's paper because this is written in a very odd notation. Um, this, is a, this is from, uh, I think, Uman and Hopcroft's book on automata. So this is uh, also one version of a um, universal Turing machine. It looks something like this. So basically you have to design some way to encode all these, these tables as, um, as the tape, right? So the tables now become uh, written onto the tape and there's a different, this, this rather huge table that reads the, the program on the tape and execute the, uh, uh, the program and produce the same result as um, the program running directly on the hardware, so to speak. And one thing I think you, you notice if you read the paper is Turing talks about the idea of skeleton tables because I think you notice in such a big program you will have um, sub portions of it that are similar but the symbols are changed, it's just like you have functions. Um, so to solve that he created something called skeleton tables which helped him write out the whole um, UTM table. Right? He could sort of substitute a symbol. It's kind of like a macro in modern terminology because Turing machines don't have um, functions but you can have a kind of like a macro, like a, a, a template for a table and you could substitute, maybe instead of, instead of having a, a state A, you could have a state X. And you could fill in the state later to say, well, after this, jump back to that other thing, right? So you could have a template and you fill in the, instead of X, use a D, right? So whatever that was X, it became the state D to help him uh, write the whole thing down because it's uh, quite complex. And there are some routines that you want to reuse here and there, right? Okay. Okay, and I get to the last part, which is the the most interesting part, I guess, which um, sort of as a start kicks off this whole field of computability theory, which is a study of what kind of problems that computers could solve. Uh, so Turing's work um, started to show the first problem. Right? So I give the hate away. He showed an uncomputable number, actually. Okay, so let me now show you this, uh, this proof, and that will be sort of the last part of the talk. Uh, this, the first part of the proof. And that sort of came, came to let us know that um, computers cannot do everything. Okay, so uh, let's see. Okay, so based on the universal Turing machine and all the work there, we know that we can we can write Turing machines right as onto the tape. Uh, and further, you can also show that you can you can convert that to a number basically, or you can sort the the string right. You can represent it as a giant string on the tape right. The Turing the, the program the program uh, key right. So on the, the, the machine, let's call the machine since uh, this is Turing's, we, we always say it's machines. So the machine and on the tape somewhere, right? So you can, you can sort of rearrange, you can maybe sort by like the length and do a lexical ordering of all the machines, right? That <coughs> is reasonable, right? And let's, let's look at only the machines that, um, that produce uh, computable numbers, which is, they produce an infinite uh, sequence of decimal numbers. So we have like machine M1, M2, M3, and so on. So these are the machines that produce an infinite list of zeros and ones, and these are the machines that uh, represent the uh, computable numbers. So let's say this is this is the sequence we produce. So this is the this is the, uh, the one third machine, right? Zero one zero one the third third. This is a one zero 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 one zero zero four, and so on so forth. Uh, let's give it a minute. Uh, okay, one zero one zero one zero. So let's just go so far, right? Mm. So then there's, of course, isn't it many of them. Uh, so we're going to appeal to something called the diagonal argument, which is a very famous uh, argument from Cantor, to show that there exists numbers that the machines cannot calculate. So that's a very standard sort of way you do it. So let's call this um, the beta in the paper. So beta is defined in such a way that, um, so we take the, it's, let's take the first, not the first machine and the first digit, so beta is going to be, the, the first digit of beta is going to be the opposite of this. So this is 1, this is, this is 0, right? This is going to be a 1. And you take the second digit of the second machine. So this is where it's called, it's the diagonal. It's called a diagonal method. This one. We look at all the digits on the diagonal. Right? Take the second digit of the second machine, and we take the opposite. So this is going to be another 1. And we take the third digit of the third machine, and we take the opposite, and we get a 0. right? And we can do this for the rest of the digits. So beta is a number we can define this way. But it turns out that beta is a number that we cannot compute. So there is no machine that can, that can generate this number beta. 
Does that make sense? Right? So why is that? So suppose there is a machine, right? So that machine uh, must have appeared somewhere on this uh, infinite list of machines. Right? Let's say M, uh, MK is this machine. Then this MK would have, uh, let's say you look like this, so 1, 1, 0, blah, blah, blah. So at, at some point, there will be the case position of this MK machine. But obviously, we know that beta is going to be different from this, from the way we define it. So this, if this is going to be a 0, let's say I wrote 0 here, then beta has to be a 1. Right? So that means it couldn't be the NK machine. Or well, it could be any machine anyway. So, so that is very important. And that's what this is all of what you need. So beta is, is, a, is a number, which is, but it's not computable. So this shows that there exist numbers that are not computable, which is not perhaps surprising because Again, if you, if, if you follow from, if you look at set theory, so the set of computable numbers is what we call countable, because you can do a one-to-one -one mapping, well, not one-to-one, -one, but you can map this uh, in relation to the natural numbers. So uh, actually, it's, in terms of cardinality of the set, it's the same as the natural numbers. Yeah, um, uh, I, I think I missed this argument. Sorry? Why is set of computable numbers countable? Never mind. I think not, not terribly important in this particular proof. I will I will skip that. Because if it would be uncountable, it would be continuum, then the <coughs> argument doesn't hold. But it's it's countable, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's countable. Uh, it's because you can you can encode all the machines as a number, so it's a subset of the natural numbers. If you look at just the description of the machines. So every machine description has to be finite. Yes. Yes, I think that's a sort of an assumption here. But basically, you, you can encode machines as strings, and you can trans translate this thing, this string as a high dimensional uh, number, right? like a uh, base, uh, base 256 or whatever. Right? So there is a, it's a subset of the natural numbers. Of course, not all numbers represent valid machines. So only a subset of the natural numbers represent valid machines. Yeah, but anyways, so the beta is an uncompetable number. Um, and what does that what does that happen? So we, that that's not so useful on its own. Um, so Turing also defines two terms, uh, one called circular and circle free. It turns out to be important. So actually, we're interested in circle circle free. So circle free machines are those that print the digits zero and one forever. So circle free. So all these are circle free machines. Uh, all these ends. Circular machines are machines that. Uh, print only a finite number of digits, and at some point gets into some, gets stuck, gets into some, I guess circular he means gets into some infinite loop. Because um, Turing's machines never stop. There's no state that says do nothing. So every state you do something, right? But it's, it's possible to get into some kind of a, uh, like an infinite loop basically, right? But where you never print any more numbers, so you get stuck. So he calls those circular machines. Is that right? So what we want is circle free, but circle free also never stop. It goes on forever. It just never gets stuck, and you keep printing zeros and ones forever. Right? We call circle free. Circle free with the dash. Not underscore. Okay. Ah. Uh, okay. Let's see how I'm going to go with this. So we can also show that there is no machine that can read the description of another machine and tell whether it is circular or circle free. And that turns out to be the key, the key thing. So this is just a step to that. So there's no machine, so many there is no machine. So you mean that in modern terminology, terminology yes. you cannot know if they stop or not? Yes, so I think Martin Davis was one who popularized the term halting problem. This is what yeah. people may have heard, but Turing never uses this word in his paper. But uh, I guess in today's terms, most of us write programs that stop. But then again, you think about like server processes, they never stop, right? So maybe Turing was, after all, more prophetic than, than we think. But in any case, yes, this is also known as the halting problem, uh, aka the halting problem. But uh, the fine fact was that uh, Turing never uses this word because his machines never stop, as you see. It, it has to print the numbers um, forever. Right. But another word for this is the halting problem. There's no machine that determines if another machine, which is written on the tape, obviously, another machine. Uh, let's say it's circle free because this is, a, this is the one we actually want. So the circle free ones are the good ones, so to speak. Circular ones are not so good. So there's no such machine. Okay, then how do we prove this? So um, let's see. Let's verify my notes. Let's just get some carry. 
Okay. Uh, okay. As usual, we do the usual thing. So let's pretend. Uh, let's pretend there's such a machine again. So proof of contradiction, very common. <coughs> so pretend there's such a machine that does this. Let's call this machine. Um, I don't know, Omega, right? It's such a popular machine. So this machine, Omega, is able to read another machine, say M, and returns whether it is. Let's say it returns one. It prints one if it's circle free, right? Reasonable thing to do. So it reads the machine from the tape and it prints one if it's uh, circle free. It prints zero if it's um, circular. Okay. What can we do with Omega? Well, it turns out if you have Omega, you can actually um, generate beta. Because then you could you could enumerate all of the machines in lexical order. You could ask uh, Omega, is it circle free? If it is, you could you could execute it with the universal machine and figure out the first digit, then print the opposite, that would be the first digit of beta. You could turn for check all the other machines until the next machine that is circle free, which is M2, and then ask the universal machine to run it to generate the first two numbers, find the second digit, and print the opposite of it. So, uh, asking about this argument, yeah. what if uh, the machine of Omega first yes. reads the number of states that machine M N has, yes, and then checks the number of digits? that corresponds to this number of states and whether it repeats after this number of digits. That would work sometimes, but not all the time, I guess. Why I not? Say the machine has finite memory because it has only M states. So you're saying you number say of that states machine can only write new digits. Yeah. So that's all the memory it has. But you could also store stuff on the tape, right? Let's say the, the tape has additional memory like before, after and Okay, so could store besides writing, writing digits, we are able to use yes, and it's all a, the and memory on the tape. Yeah, you can use a finite uh, set of symbols, but it's a finite set of symbols. And not, but the, the amount of memory we can use on the tape is infinite. It's infinite, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And in, in, in actually, in, in real life, in, in, in the paper, he actually uses uh, alternate positions of the tape. So I didn't, I didn't do it here because it's a bit confusing. So the actual machines will print numbers like this: zero, one. These are these are. Squares used for working memory. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so th it, there's also yeah. In, in terms of this, this is actually enough. You don't need more than this. Like extra space in between the actual space of the output to do your uh, you uh, just store data. Memory. Of course, this is infinitely long tape, so you have infinite these extra squares. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So, and really that's the sort of final thing. We get to this. Um, Point. Okay. So, uh, what was I saying? Okay. So, there's no machine because if there was, we could use it to enumerate uh, all the circular-free machines, right, and not get stuck. Because if you try to run the circular machines, you get stuck forever. So, we can enumerate the cir circle-free machines and, and and just print the opposite of what they print, right? And we can print beta eventually. So, this we can use omega to construct yet another machine that could print um, beta, which we know is impossible because there's no machine that can print beta by the prior argument, right? So, so essentially, the, the anchor is actually beta in some sense because this is a number that is uncomputable, and from there we can sort of imply that this is uncomputable. And of course, further on, there's something called Rice's theorem that says any property that depends on just the behavior. Really sorry, can we construct the machine that prints beta in if it's uncomputable? We can because we just argued that we cannot construct this machine. Yeah. That also means that we cannot check whether it's circular or circle free. Exactly, exactly. Yes, yes, sorry, I didn't go back, back to the video. Yes, so we can't construct that machine uh, and because our original assumption that there is such a machine, Omega, is false. Right? So there, there is no such machine that can do this. And there's a generalized version that says, uh, not in Turing's paper, but further subsequent work that says that any non trivial property of, of machines suffer from this problem. It's uncomputable. So in subsequently, Turing also shows in his paper that to determine whether a machine ever prints the symbol zero is also uncomputable. Right? So he goes ask, does this machine ever print a zero somewhere in the future, like when it, wherever? Does it ever print a zero? Right? So that property is also impossible. Similarly, does it ever print a one? Or, you know, does it ever print any? Uh, all these kind of properties are undecidable, right? uh, un uncomputable. Definitely. Okay, and to the last part. Uh, so the Decision problem, and then the last part is kind of straightforward, I guess. Then, um, so basically, we can just reformulate these kind of statements in logic, right? 
it's, it's kind of cumbersome, but we can do that. We can reformulate these kind of impossible statements. Um, we can, so we can, we can take an actual machine, like uh, an actual machine, and figure out whether it's circle, and we have a statement like, uh, like uh, let's, let's say, M X is circle free, or M X will print some zero at some point in time. Right? This kind of statements we can we can translate it into the the statement of the formal <coughs> logical system. Right. So similarly, there is no mechanism for determining whether this statement is a is a provable statement, which will be that will be equivalent to solving. Uh, this, this finding a machine that can that can solve it. So there's no machine that can solve these kind of problems, which means the decision problem is unsolvable, right? Because any kind of statement we can, uh, with some care, translate it into logical terms, into a into a statement of the of the formal system. Or we can we can take so MX is a particular kind of it's a particular machine. It has certain states and all. That. It's, it's a specific machine. We can take that specific machine and translate it into sort of logical uh, constructs. And you can formulate this statement in logic. If you can throw this to the decision algorithm, right, and ask the decision algorithm, is this a can this be proved from the axioms? And obviously, such a statement cannot be proved, right? I mean, because there there's no mechanical way that can solve this kind of problems. So I mean, as soon as your logic allows you to express this kind of problem, then yes. the logic is not correct. Correct. Again, you have the logic has to have sufficient faculties to encode. So the rules of uh, how the machine sort of work, right? this idea of states, and this idea of some kind of infinite tape, and so on. <coughs> yeah. Okay, so I think that is the end. So, okay, if you're interested to find out more, I would really encourage you to look at the following references. I think the first one that helped me a lot was um, Charles Petal's The Annotated Turing. He literally takes Turing's paper and adds a whole bunch of commentary uh, interspersed. So the whole paper is in, reproduced in the book, but he has uh, additional paragraphs which gives commentary on, on the work. The second one is um, The Universal Computer by Martin Davis, which traces the, the line of development from Leibniz all the way down to um, Turing, and further down the line to von Neumann and folks uh, that actually built the first physical uh, universal computer. Of course, this is, Turing's work was the conceptual, right? It, it showed the way that we can produce such machines, and Subsequent work has been to the engineering side. How do you actually build it out of physical parts like uh, vacuum tubes and stuff like that? So that's Martin Davis's work. Of course, um, 2012 was um, Turing's centenary and uh, lots of videos and lectures uh, given in that time. So you could look, go for Turing's centenary. There's lots of um, stuff on uh, Turing's work, not just his work in computability, but also his work in biology and uh, mathematics. Right. Thank you for your time. And if you have any questions. Yeah, do time. Hmm. Yes. Yes, my question is kind of like general. Maybe it's a bit simple. Like, pardon me. Go this. ahead, please. Um, actually, like when, when, let's say you're going through a computer science course and stuff, so yeah. there's this I said, idea of a finite state machine, right? So you yes. can analyze algorithm by treating it as a finite state machine, you optimize algorithm you know, by optimizing a finite state machine. Okay. So what's the relationship between a finite state machine that you can recall these days and a Turing machine that uh, ah, okay, interesting. So actually, a finite state machine is very similar. So if you look at the, the broad picture again of the Turing machine, right? So, so beside the tape, which is infinite, the the logic in the box is actually some kind of finite state machine, actually. But this finite state machine is actually well, normally in finite state machines, you don't get to write to an external tape. So there's no there's no write. So it, it just jumps around internally, going to different states. So the Turing machine, in addition to to the control, it has a way to remember things because you can write it on the tape and you can move back and forth and come back to it later on. Right. So it has a memory. So a finite state machine um, doesn't sort of have a memory per se, it has finite memory, whereas a Turing machine has potentially infinite memory because the tape is infinitely long. Yeah. So if your finite state machine has like 10 states, basically your sort of your memory is basically which state you're in, right? right? You sort of encode the memory in the states. But the Turing machine has an extra memory. Right? So it's kind of also like the table that you show that you have A and B, state A and state B, and what does E yes. do? So that is actually like a finite state machine. Yes, yes. Which is maybe back to the idea that you can actually tweak the model a lot. So you can throw away the tape basically, right? And what you get is what we now call a finite state machine. Right? So, and if you put in like a stack instead of a tape, you get a different kind of thing. 
uh, push down automata. Basically, if you look at the automata theory, it, it studies all various kinds of machines that, that takes this basic model and try to rearrange things. So instead of a tape, we have a, a stack, or we have a queue, or we have a, some other thing. Right? It could still work, right? I mean, it may, may not be as powerful as this, but it could still do certain things. Yeah. So yeah, FSM is basically throw away the tape. No tape. Yeah. Yeah. So like all these concepts more or less descended from Alan Turing's paper. Um, I would I would not be so sure about finite state machine, but you could see that there's a connection. I'm not sure Alan Turing's paper was the first paper that that led to this kind of work about <coughs> MSN and all these kind of things. Um, but I would think the the notion of studying restricted forms of computation like finite state machine would be a variation of trying to restrict the amount of resource because a lot of computer science is about looking at solving problems with limited resource, right? So finite state machine means no memory. So there's no RAM, that's just that's just like chips. So what kind of problem can we solve with just um, finite memory, right? Instead of having a large RAM to do stuff. So I guess it, it could be. So FSM may not be directly related, but the idea of studying finite limited resource machines certainly is a is a variation on, on Turing's work, yeah. Yes? Um, how do we know that uh, as though this might be in the paper itself, yeah. how do we know that uh, circle-free automata based on Turing, Turing's model of computation, yes. that they will have a limit to what uh, a limit to what they produce? For example, um, let's say let's mm -hmm. say you imagine this thing which uh, has a zero. It, it starts maybe you start at a certain place. Yeah, yeah. Go then, on. Uh, I'll just wait for anyway. It, it changes it to a one, then it goes to the next stop. It's a zero, then it changes to a one. Um, let me try anything else. Um, right. Oh. Maybe we take it offline, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> separately, separately, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think there are no more questions. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for your time. Okay.